Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Darger, and I'm with the University of Minnesota Extension's Center for Community Vitality. We are pleased to be presenting a special webinar series, Retaining Businesses During the Pandemic. And our first session was held on April 14th, The Economic Considerations of COVID-19, How Are Economists Thinking About This? This webinar provides a brief overview of current economic thinking about the impact of COVID-19. It also provides a framework for understanding how the national trends may translate to your community. Furthermore, you'll learn about big picture concepts on the impact of COVID-19 and tools for helping your, your community understand its impact at the local level. Our presenters in this session were our senior economic impact analyst, Bridget Tuck, and she was interviewed by Neil Linscheid, a community economics extension educator. You can learn more about this series later on at the end of the session. You'll find the link and I hope you attend more sessions. And here is Neil. Going to tell you what the stock market will do tomorrow or uh, next week, uh, nor what uh, maybe the bigger, broader global macroeconomic situation will be. Uh, we're both coming at this from the community level economics and maybe even the regional economics perspective. So I thought maybe we could just start with asking Bridget to tell us a little bit about uh, your background. You've done work on economic impact studies, and maybe you could just share a few things uh, to bring everyone up to speed on, on what you've done and, and how you're thinking about this. Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's nice to see so many friendly, familiar faces across the state of Minnesota. Uh, as Neil said, I work in the area of economic impact analysis. So I work a lot with communities to just sort of help them understand what does your economy look like? Uh, how has your economy been changing? Maybe what are some of the drivers of your economy? Really helping communities tell their economic story. And the idea behind that is to really help uh, local officials, whether it be elected officials or economic developers or community chamber of commerce, those kinds of folks, uh, tell their, be able to communicate with their communities about what's important and really be able to make some decisions using data to guide uh, those decisions and think through their, their economic future. Um, so my mind immediately goes to when, when this started happening um, is, I know we, we hear a lot about what's happening nationally, but my mind is really at translating what's happening at the national level, at the state level, what we know in terms of data, and then how do we put that into a package or tools uh, that local people can use to help make decisions I'm sure at this point you've got, if you're working in the area of economic development, you've got the gamut from some folks on your teams and in your communities who maybe don't think this is a thing and maybe need some convincing as to why this is important, why you should invest resources in helping your businesses and all the way to folks who are maybe at panic mode and could use some data and some analysis to help them kind of focus and really understand the scope and the size of the problem. So. That's where my mind has been, Neil, in terms of what can we do around COVID and the economy. And sort of part of the hope today is to talk a little bit about the big picture and then give some tools that we might be able to use at the community level. Sure. And, and one of those tools that we often see and we hear about are things like um, economic impact studies or people will talk about economic impacts of, uh, of a plant closure, plant opening. Uh, so maybe you could just sh share with us a little bit more about what is economic impact and, and really maybe that big picture. Why haven't we seen this number yet for this situation? What's the holdup? Sure. Excellent question, Neil. And I'm going to just quickly uh, share my screen to just show you uh, one visualization. If you give me just a second. So when we talk about economic impact, we tend to think about it um, in terms of, both direct and indirect impacts. Let me share this with you, here we go. Um, so when we talk about direct impacts, that's the initial change that's happening in the economy. So if we're talking about, you know, in a, in a town, a, a manufacturer coming to town, that's usually fairly easy to know, right? We know how many jobs they're trying to create, what sort of economic activity will come from that. So that direct impact is often very easy to understand. Uh, in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, that direct impact is really not uh, so clear, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then we have what we call input-output tools, and those help models, and those help us figure out what are those ripple effects. So we know we have this direct effect happening, 
what is the effect on the greater economy because of this direct effect? Um, so we economists really have two problems at this point. Uh, one is figuring out what that direct effect is. Um, so we, there's a, just a ton of uncertainty at this point about that, that direct effect. Part of that is because uh, we're still in the middle of it, right? We don't exactly know uh, when we'll be able to go back to our business as usual in terms of our economy. So that's making it very difficult. Uh, part of it is just that consumers really are the driver of our economy. Uh, so if you remember your, your GDP equation from uh, college economics, uh, consumer spending is 70% of our GDP. Uh, so, so much of this is going to depend on how the consumer reacts. Uh, if many of us um, are at home and, and uh, could keep our jobs and keep working, uh, when we are able to go back to our, our normal activities, if consumer spending kind of picks up where it left off, we may be come out of this fairly quickly. And what economists are kind of calling a V recovery, right? We're going to go, we might be down in unemployment, but go kind of recover very quickly. Uh, if the consumer doesn't feel that way, uh, we may end up in more of an L shape where it takes us a while to get our, our jobs back. Um, and it's really sort of upending both sides of, you know, supply and demand have sort of been upended in all of this. And on top of that, it's hard for us to know, um, you know, sometimes you see, you see an economic impact number pretty quickly coming out of, say, a, a storm, uh, because we have good models that can sort of predict uh, this was a storm, this is the area covered, this is the damage that was done. We can usually fairly quickly estimate that. Uh, we don't have those kinds of tools in this situation. And we have kind of a labor shock here that we've never sort of seen before, uh, where we have this massive spike in unemployment as well. So I did catch the state economist yesterday uh, talking, and she was talking a little bit about um, the, the state. Uh, they work with a, a company called IHS Market, um, which helps them determine what the state revenue forecast will be like. Uh, so this is their prediction or their sort of outlook, if you will, for the future here. Um, you can see uh, the real GDP change. The, the gray is what they had projected in February when they did the, the state budget in February. Um, the dark blue then is their April revision. Um, so their particular company that they work with uh, is projecting a 5%, 5.4% decline in fiscal year 20, uh, but then coming right back in fiscal year uh, 21 with an increase of 6.3%. So they are forecasting the V, uh, with a deep incline, but then coming right back up out of it. Um, you'll note that even though there, there's still recovery there, it wouldn't be as large if we had just stayed on our, our track. Our growth is still going to be slower than it would have been. Um, but worth noting, uh, this word that I think is out there amongst all us economists right now is uncertainty. Um, so basically, they up, assign a probability uh, and they put a 45% probability on this forecast. Um, so very much uh, still up in the air in terms of where this is going to go. So long story short, we don't really know what that direct impact is yet. So it's hard for us um, to go ahead and do that modeling in terms of what the direct impact. Some folks have kind of started going out there and doing some modeling around, um, you know, if we had a 50% decline in food sales, you know, uh, restaurant sales, what does that mean? Um, kind of starting to, to start of, um, going at the pieces of this. Uh, but we really don't have the full size and scope. Uh, and the other thing, if we go back to that chart there, um, our indirect and our induced impacts, this is kind of a theoretical argument among economists, uh, but those indirect and induced impacts are really uh, measured by our models. And our models are based on a sort of a snapshot of the economy. Um, so looking at what do our spending patterns look like and our businesses and how they spend money. And you can imagine that if we sort of destroy that spending pattern, um, our models aren't going to be very good at uh, predicting either. Uh, so I think, Neil, in, a, in, a, in sort of a long explanation, that's why we haven't seen um, really any economic impact study to date. It's just too hard to get our hands around that di direct impact and then concerns about whether the model will do a, a good job on those indirect and induced uh, effects. And I will, as I pause here and let Neil talk, I will post into the chat the link to the state economy, uh, the state economist revenue forecast, so everybody can see that chart and read more about how they came up with those numbers. So, Bridget, I'm I'm hearing you say that it's not as if economists aren't trying to understand what's happening here, but just the nature of how 
complicated things are and all the, the different levels of this is, is making it that um, it's difficult to be as precise as they maybe normally would have been when everything was working like it normally did. When uh, the world was operating as it did yesterday, uh, it would be easy to take the, the model that is in your computer or in some other economist computer and just change a few numbers and see what it what it produces but this this is changing how that model works it's changing the underlying math that would derive any new information is that correct yeah you're right neil that's exactly right uh we've we've we're fundamentally changing our production functions or the way we we produce things and as we do so that model is less and less able um, to accurately predict how a change is, is rippling through the economy. And I would add too that listening to Dr. Kalamakitis yesterday talking about this, a lot of our leading indicators are also going to sort of be off for a while. Um, so one thing that they rely on, for example, is sales tax data. Well, the state has offered a sales tax um, deferment, right? So we won't even, you know, normally we would know the next month what the sales tax collections were for the month before, which would help us understand how the economy is changing. Businesses don't have to pay it for, you know, they've been given a deferment, so we won't have that data um, as a, just an example of the complications. Some of our, our things that we use to take the pulse of the economy are also going to lay. And you mentioned a, a production function. What is that? I mean, that, that, I don't know that that's something that is always on the tip of my tongue when I'm thinking about an economic situation. What is that? Where does that, that come from in, um, when you're trying to understand the economic impact of something? So the production function, essentially, we know at, at the national level how the uh, goods and services flow through our economy. So we know, like, if we're going to build a pencil, for example, we know how much of each input it takes to produce that pencil. And so then what we can do is if we know that production function or that expenditure pattern to produce one unit or one dollar worth of pencil, uh, we can look at what if we were to build a hundred dollars worth of pencils, right? And you can imagine that at, at the small, like we talked about, at the small level, those sort of minor changes, the, the, the production function holds true. You know, we need X amount of, of graphite, and X amount of wood, and X amount of eraser materials, and X amount of labor. Uh, but if we blow up those supply chains, uh, we don't really know what those, those production functions are anymore. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems like there's information here that we get from the national level that's, that's changing. And I know a lot of the people on this call today, we're at the the community level, or maybe we're thinking about this at the regional level. Um, some of us might be thinking about it at the state of Minnesota, but as you, as we start to think about, okay, how will this play out in our community? How can these ideas about economic impact or production function, the things that you've mentioned so far, how can those help us and, and guide us in some of our decision making? Yeah, I'm still on mute, right? Yes, I'm good. Uh, so I think there's a couple of tools out there, Neil, that as I've been thinking about this and how we do this at the local level. Uh, the first thing I really think, you know, I know that everybody is sort of being overwhelmed and swamped with all the things that are happening out there. So just kind of coming back to Community Development 101, right? Um, you need to form your teams and then prioritize. Um, I'm sure many of you are swamped with a million and one different things coming at you and sort of being able to understand what, what is the important thing that I need to focus on right now. And I think data has a role to play in that. Um, so I just wanted to show you three different sort of ways I'm thinking about this, data that you can go out there for yourselves and, and get in some shape or form uh, and think about. Um, so for example, here I have, what we did is looked at uh, Moody's Analytics put out for the state of Minnesota, or for the, for the nation, uh, what they thought the industries that would be most impacted uh, by the COVID-19 would be. Um, so they had leisure and hospitality, travel arrangements, employment services, transportation, and mining. So then what I did is for each county in the state of Minnesota, I went out and I calculated what percentage of total employment is in those different industries, uh, in those, in, uh, those industries grouped together. Uh, and then I started by quartile. Now, the good news is in Minnesota, um, our top county in terms of percentage of employment in these sectors 
is at 20%. So we are not as dependent on these sectors as other states and areas of the country might be. Uh, but you can see here, I have the red are in the top quartile. So those are the counties that have a higher percentage of their employment in these five sectors. Uh, so those might be, you know, if you, if you start to think about your economy, what's driving my economy? You know, if, if I'm really invested in leisure and hospitality, uh, and transportation, uh, travel arrangements, these might be counties that need to really think about what does this mean? How is this impacting me? Uh, so you can see Northeast Minnesota really known as sort of our tourism part of the state, uh, really facing some, you know, have a higher percentage of their employment in those sectors, as well as our Twin Cities metro area, and then some of our, uh, what I would call regional centers. Uh, so I think Marshall is in there, uh, Stearns County a little bit higher, um, some of those areas as well. Um, so that's just one way to think about it. Like who, what is driving my economy right now? Uh, and then what are sort of the, the, the industries that are being most affected and how are, is that playing out in my community? So that's one way to think about it. Um, a second way I, I've been looking at this is um, the Department of Employment and Development came out in the last couple of days here uh, with unemployment claims by region and by industry uh, and by occupation. So this is for Northeast Min Minnesota. What I did is I pulled the top 10 occupations in terms of number of jobs. So in Northeast Minnesota, 9,000 in the parentheses there, if you look in the chart, uh, 9,850 jobs are in our retail sales jobs. And then I took the unemployment claims as a percentage of total jobs. So 10% of retail sales people filed unemployment claims uh, in the three week period that we've just kind of been in where we're seeing that spike. Um, so overall in Minnesota, 9% of all Minnesota jobs filed for unemployment claims, 12% in Northeast. So just like our map sort of indicated, they were a little bit higher in terms of jobs being affected by this. And then you can see here the top industry. So again, thinking about your economy, these are the top industry, these are the top occupations in my particular um, area, in my city, my county, my whatever region you're working at. And then looking at how, what, what was the percentage of unemployment claims? So you can see construction trades, 23% uh, of construction trade uh, employees filed unemployment claims um, in this period. So if you're one of those cities in the Northeast that has a lot of construction trades, you might really start to think about how is this affecting me? You know, this, I might be getting hit or hit harder by this. What does this really mean for us? Um, if you have fewer, fewer people in that particular industry, maybe you, you don't have to worry quite as much about it. But again, giving some insights into who exactly is being affected by this, and how is this playing out in my particular economy? And then I'm also, you know, because I, I am kind of an optimist, so I thought I'd end on a little bit more of an optimistic note. Uh, another thing that's out there is a tool called, it's a job postings tool. Um, so you can go online and look at how have job postings changed um, from like year, month over month, year over year. Uh, and you can see these are the industries, four industries in Minnesota. Uh, that had increases in the number of job postings. Uh, not surprisingly, couriers and messengers increased by about 16%. Um, our building and garden supply stores, trucking, transportation, and then general merchandise stores uh, actually still seeing a little bit of an increase in job postings. Uh, so a little bit of bright news there, Neil, for you at the end. But again, just some ways to start thinking about how do we take what we're hearing and then translating that into what's really happening in our communities. So it's, it's, it's hard to um, wrap my mind around it. It seems like the whole world is being impacted equally by, by this situation. But what I'm hearing you say is that in our communities, in, um, in our regions, that different businesses are really, really feeling even more of a sting. So uh, if we wanted to anticipate what's happening, we might not be hearing from them today, but we sure those those businesses that you showed, those industries that were uh, predicted to hit high unemployment, we would want to be definitely knocking on doors if we hadn't heard from people anticipating that there's challenges. Now, coming back to this idea of production function, is that something that we can use to understand who who else uh, like 
those construction businesses, they hire people, they are, uh, they have suppliers. Does that help us understand who else along the supply chain we should be checking in with? We should be uh, really crafting a new program for, or uh, doing something that maybe we wouldn't do um, normally. I think so, Neil. I mean, I think that's a really good point that we're kind of feeling this, this first wave, right, of like this is who's filed for unemployment insurance in this first kind of um, immediate sense. But you're right, as, as if we see a, a 25% decrease in construction activity, we are going to start to see some of those ripple impacts back on those construction, um, maybe specialty construction type people, um, their suppliers, wholesale trade, they do a lot of business in terms of purchasing, um, you know, all the, all the things that might go into a construction project in terms of equipment and, and fittings and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then just the spending by those construction workers as well. If they're not working, um, that's less household income being spent around our communities as well. So right now, the, these businesses that we're, we're really hearing from, it's, it's easy for us to say there are more out there that we're not hearing from that uh, if we're involved in economic development or if we just care about our community, then um, it's, it's time to find ways to get in touch with them, find ways to um, make sure that even though they're not saying so, that their concerns are being heard and that uh, they know that we're paying attention. Yeah, and I think again, that's where I would go back to having that data. Like if you look at Northeast and the construction trades, right? So there's a couple of different jumping off points that you could go from there. Um, let's just say you are a community that has a couple of construction companies in your community. So uh, one jumping off point could be looking at workforce. So you know that construction workers are being hit hard. You can go out there and find data about, you know, what are their wages? What are their skill sets? What are maybe other things that they could be employed in? So there's ways to kind of follow that workforce trail. And then there's ways, like you said, to follow kind of that input trail. So talking to those companies to understand who are they making purchases from? What other local companies might be affected sort of a little bit longer term because of this? And then even uh, if you don't have a high construction, but let's say you're, you're a strong manufacturing town, uh, but you're, you produce uh, air conditioning units for households, and you know construction is, so, is slowing, you might expect to see them slowing as well. So again, thinking through who, who, is your, who are your players in your economy and sort of understanding um, how this is working for them and having this data sort of as that jumping off point. Hey, Bridget. Yeah. Um, just wanna jump in here. There was a couple of questions when you're showing, I think the Northeast Minnesota data slide, but um, Emily asked, are tribal nations included in that data? And Sean Herhusky asked, uh, what were the five sectors? And that's probably back five minutes, but. Yeah. Nope, I can go, definitely. Uh, so the tribal, yes. Okay, so the two data sources I was looking at is unemployment claims. So that obviously does not, you know, go with necessarily with tribal affiliation. Anyone can be part of that. And then our jobs data is, should include employment. Um, at like, you know, like a tribal casino or a tribally run grocery store and kind of thing like that should be included in this data. Yes. Um, the other question you had, Michael, oh, the five sectors, uh, they were leisure and hospitality. So that would include accommodations, food service of those types of things, travel arrangements. So, you know, kind of booking services for travel, employment services, which uh, would be like temp workers, transportation, and then mining. And I, I don't know why mining is included in there, to be honest, um, but that was what Moody's had predicted to be the industry's hardest hit. Well, Bridget, I wanna ask uh, folks on the line to, if they have other questions or comments, to start putting those in the chat box. I do have a, another question for you here to round out uh, the time that we had planned. And that's really, what advice would you have for someone uh, that that wants to gather more data, wants to put together some information for their community and uh, help drive that, that decision making based on um, things that we know um, as closer to fact uh, versus sort of that the uh, emotional or, or gut impact. Yeah, so I'm sharing my screen again here. Um, number one, you know, I uh, 
we in Extension have some resources. I think I saw that Joyce put into the chat our um, link to our, our report, but as well as, you know, we have Extension educators across the state of Minnesota, like Neil, uh, who really work one-on-one -on -one with communities. And I know the general opinion has been that we're wanting to help and, and ready to help and want to help communities have these conversations. So uh, certainly reaching out to your uh, Extension educator is a good place to start. Uh, but I also put here on the slide of uh, the DEED Unemployment uh, website. They have a great kind of interactive website right now where you can uh, look at all the data in terms of which occupations are being affected um, by region. You can look at different demographic pieces as well. Um, so that's a really great website they have up and running. And then uh, EMSI, which is a, it's a subscription service, uh, but they have, for the time being, opened up their job posting data. Uh, so you could go look at the state of Minnesota for job postings, those, those changes in job postings. So um, you can, I used it as a, a way to see some hope that there were some increases in job postings, um, but you can go in there and kind of look at which industries are seeing the biggest decline in job postings as well as um, number of job postings. So um, despite the unemployment claims and, and, and the decline in the number of job postings, there are still some industries that continue to hire, maybe at a slower rate than they were hiring before, uh, but there are certainly still uh, job postings out there. So um, those are some sites that everybody on this call could just go to today and kind of explore. They're fairly simple and easy to use and could get some data that's relevant to your community. And Bridget, a question came in, of course, about whether we're going to share the slides, and I'm assuming we can do that. Sure. I don't really have them, you know, in some sort of fancy format. That's okay. <laughs> visuals to support today, but yes. Definitely. Fancy's out the window right now. <laughs> okay, we got some comments and questions coming in, but Neil, do you have some more questions in your... No, I, I think that was the the end of the the questions that Bridget and I had had planned, and I I very much agree with what you're saying, Bridget. Around the, um, you can get the data yourself. You can look at these things. Uh, another group that I would add uh, to talk to um, are the the labor market analysts at at Deed. Your regional labor market analysts are also just uh, an amazing resource for you to check in with, and um, uh, I'm sure many of you already know that, but just another plug for all the, the great resources we have across Minnesota. One of them is here on the line, Sean Herhusky and probably others, but. Well, it looks like we did have a few uh, more questions here, Bridget. Has there been an analysis of economic drivers for rural Minnesota? I think that's a good question. I know the answer, but maybe you can elaborate more. Sure. Um, so yes, it's, uh, we did a study of the economic composition of greater Minnesota. It is on our website. If you just kind of go to extension.umn.edu uh, and then um, it, like learn more about community development and you'll, you'll find the page from there. Um, we also do, or I have done quite a bit of just kind of going around the state, talking to individual counties. So I saw Judy from Meeker County was on here, Dan from Sherburne County. Uh, so I do quite regularly go around, so I do have kind of more some counties if there's a particular county that you're interested in. I may have been there <laughs> and done that recent, uh, recently. recently. Uh, so there are a couple of resources out there, yes. And, and you can go um, to, to DEED, again, to LMI or to their website um, and look like QC, the QC, I like the QCW data, um, so you could pull for your particular county um, you know, some of your employment statistics as well to get a sense if you wanted to do that on your own. Well, it does look like it's 930 and that's what we promised everyone uh, we would do. I think our, our commitment here will be that we'll stay on the line for maybe the next uh, 15 minutes. If there are questions that come up in the chat box, we'll stick around uh, to, to answer those and, and just be here for you. But I I think if you're in agreement, Bridget, that ends our prepared uh, webinar stuff. And um, we really wanna thank you for participating today and uh, joining us. We hope that it was useful. And we hope that if you have ideas on additional sessions or additional things that would be helpful for you during this time, that you would let us know and we will 
our promise to you is that we'll do our best uh, to prepare uh, more webinars like this to respond to things like that. And thanks, Bridget and Neil. We have some uh, more comments and thanks coming in. I did, if anyone has a chance to do the evaluation, we'd appreciate that. Also, any other topics that you'd like to see webinars or uh, you know, info sheets or other forms of getting information out, let us know, put them in the chat or put it in the evaluation or send, you know, send one of us an email, give us a call. We want to hear from you and, uh, and uh, hang in there. Any other questions? And I know Eric put in the information about uh, uh, some of the impact on mining. So there's a link there if you scroll up, if you missed that. Yes, and I had seen that too, Eric. I was interested to see that particular announcement to kind of follow how that works out. And Joyce put a link into, I think that's a study that you did, Bridget? Yep. Right? Yep. And I can't remember if we mentioned it, but uh, we are working on some kind of uh, clearinghouse blog-like um, web page. And so when we get that out, again, we'll post it out to people. But our high watermark here was 103 participants out of 160 who registered. So that's a pretty good showing. So we, all, we also had this recorded. So we'll put that up uh, when we can on our web page. Yes, uh, Thomas, we got a Thief River Falls um, webinar coming up a week from this Friday on the 24th. So look for that in your emails or social media. That'll be the same time another webinar in this series. And I did see, several of you mentioned, okay, there was a car being dri not driven, or, or <laughs> there was someone playing with a, a whiteboard during the call. Um, the U of M has a new security for Zoom, and I had all the settings just right so people couldn't share their screens or whatever. But yes, I saw the car being uh, written on top of your whiteboard, Bridget. I'm assuming that wasn't your Henry. <laughs> it went away. I didn't do anything to make it go away. I'm glad it went away. Those of you who private chatted me, yes, I saw it. I didn't know what to do besides just shut the whole thing down because there was no setting for if some someone starts drawing on the whiteboard, uh, but it looks like we either got hacked or someone um, someone in Bridget's household was having fun. <laughs> no, it does sound like something my nine-year-old would find very entertaining. <laughs> he was not in here, so. I thought it was a production see, function. A, a question here from Mike. Uh, yeah. Mike Wimmer, are, are there plans to explore the impact this pandemic will have on tourism-heavy counties and areas? I would say yes. So I think where we are right now is kind of figuring out where is this impact playing out uh, and then kind of working with individual communities on that. Um, I know we are affiliated or part of what we do in extension is with the tourism center. Uh, and I know that they are very much following this and trying to help our tourism related businesses. Uh, right now, I think kind of in that mode of what do we do? How do we support them? How do we keep them? Uh, in business through this time period, but then looking longer term at what that what that means for our communities as well. Thanks, Mike. And there may be a separate webinar series for travel and tourism. Uh, our, our tourism center has been talking about that. There, there's no announced plans yet, but you may see a separate series of, of, of webinars uh, for that specific sector, so stay tuned. Shin Yi was on the line today. I don't know if she's still on the line. I'd unmute you if I if I could find you, but you're probably called in, Shin Yi. So the call in numbers just are numbers, so I don't know who's who on those. Well, we'll do uh, one final call here before we, I guess, close this down. Uh, any few more minutes to add any questions or comments that you have into that chat box. I'm not sure what color you should paint your garage, but um, <laughs> questions related to <laughs> community economics are welcome. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's one. There do community do community demographics have an impact on the analysis, mm -hmm. i.e., older communities more at risk of long-term economic impact? I think that's a it's a really good question, and I think there, there's a couple of things with demographics, and that's where I think the occupation data can be helpful. Um, because what we're kind of thinking about for our next step here is, okay, we know which occupations are being hit hardest. Now we can go get some data on who's in those occupations. Um, so for example, I was pulling some data for kind of the Duluth area and looking at um, impacts like in healthcare. There's been some, I mean, I know we hear a lot about the COVID-19 and how we need more, uh, obviously we've got our, our healthcare people on the front line, but at the same time, we've stopped elective procedures. Um, so actually some of our hospitals are, are laying off folks. And uh, if you look at the demographic data, at least in Northeast Minnesota, 75% uh, of the healthcare supports are, are female, right? Um, and they tend to be kind of in that middle income age range. Um, and so there's some good data out there about who those folks are and who's being hit hardest by this. Uh, and, and really looking into that and taking kind of those next, next steps. So I think there is some really good demographic stuff. You were asking a little bit more about older communities. I, again, I think it's just gonna kind of come down to your base and what does your economy look like. Uh, some of those older communities maybe have a more established uh, downtown, maybe are more resilient in, in certain ways. Uh, other communities that have grown faster more recently maybe have more of a, a different looking economy. Um, maybe they're resilient in other ways. So again, I think it's just going to kind of come down to understanding who's in your community, what industries are there, and, and how are they, how are these impacts um, affecting them? And another thing on that might be um, there are purchasing different. There are consumers do have different patterns um, in different age groups, and the things they purchase are, are different. How they purchase are are different. Um, at this point, we just don't know enough about what's what's happened and how long it will last and all those sorts of factors to be able to say how those differences will matter or not. Um, for instance, we hear in, in a lot of communities a big surge in interest in buying local, staying local, and supporting businesses. Um, you know, it's, it's probably years from now that we'll know if there was some difference in demographics uh, that, that motivated more people to buy local or motivated people to, more people to buy online or whatever. Right now, if you can find toilet paper on the internet or in your local store, I think you're buying it. <laughs> One last call for any further questions you have out there and then uh, we will We'll, we'll be leaving. Uh, and I think that means that you'll all get kicked out as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I see and, Michael's put a call for the evaluation. So if you do evaluate us, that does help us to get better in the future too. So appreciate anyone who fills out the, the evaluation. Well, again, thank you all for joining in. And uh, I'm sure you'll see a follow-up email from us about, about this. And I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks, Neil. See you guys again at a future event. <laughs>